out here after 30 years, yeah, I ain't got nothing, but I'm going to have something because I'm rich in personality, you know, and uh, I'm rich in love, my family love me, and that really, that's, that's really the, all that counts. Yeah, man, Towns hit that boy, and he just bagged up, and Towns advanced on him and hit him again, pop, pop. The other boy looked at him and seen what was going on, and he acted like he hesitated, like he was going to try to stop him, and then he just took off running. When he took off running, Towns acknowledged that he running, so Towns just leave him alone and start chasing him. So now you see Towns chasing him, and he running like the Dickens, man. He trying to get to that uh, entryway. If you get to that entryway, it's a gate that can be locked, and it's also usually an officer right there. But I can tell you right now, <laughs> Officer ain't gonna save your life with that knife coming. He gonna get out the way and he gonna use his radio. He not gonna use any physicality and jump in the way of that knife. He ain't gonna take that knife for you by, uh, by no means. You can believe that I ain't seen that happen in all of my 33 years in prison. They not gonna take that knife for you. The most they gonna do is yell, scream, holler, get on the radio, blow a whistle or whatever. But man, Taz was chasing them. And once they got through the entryway, they was out of my vision. But what I heard was he did catch him. He caught him out on the boulevard. He hit him a couple of times until the police came and jumped on him. You know, when they get 30, 40 police, they will jump on you then. Because they probably got gear, ride gear, whatever. You know, so they jumped on him, got him, you know, got him up, got the knife up off of him, man. Both of the boys went to the hospital, man. Towns got locked up. I did not see Towns anymore for years later, but I did see him again. But at that time, that was it, you know what I'm saying? I guess he got so frustrated, so irritated, he already losing, you know, in the poker. His money depleted. He the sold one boy, then the other two done plotted to leave him. So I guess he felt like he was at his wit's end. He ain't had nothing left, so he just going to go all the way out, you know? He was going to go all the way out. So it was crazy, man, and like I say, all of this now, I'm reminding you this is in the beginning of my bit, so I ain't seen this type of stuff before, especially in these scenarios where it got this type of stuff going on, these type of dynamics. So I seen dudes get hit already, get the Bethlehem put in all that, but for situations like this, I hadn't seen nothing like this. They call that domestic affairs. You know, I hadn't seen nothing like that, but um, it was crazy. But Towns was the first one that I seen those type of situations occur with, man. But like I say, he, he he was a wild dude, man. He was a wild dude, and it was three of them now. It's three of them in that system. So when you got three brothers in that system, especially you got three brothers that's known, that say you got to beef with one of them, right? You got to beef with this dude in the system, and you end up having to get in an altercation with him, be a physical or whatever, whatever, and then you leave him, you may get transferred to another institution and you go to another institution and his brother is on the other institution and you go and heard that beat. Now, I didn't know too much, like I said, about the dude William, but I felt like I, I heard and I'm almost sure he was the oldest one. But I did know Hercules and I know you... <laughs> you ain't want no beef with him unless you was in the killing business. If you weren't in the killing business, you ain't really want no beef with Hercules. You ain't want no beef with him whatsoever. Cause uh, I tell you, man, this dude was huge. He was strong. He was crazy. He was missing a, a few screws. And he, 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 not only was he strong, he knew karate. He knew all of that stuff with his feet. And man, I'm talking about, he just was a different type of cat, you know, but he had this big, uh, tag on his name too where you know what I'm saying people say certain things about him or I don't know how much is true how much ain't true but a lot a lot of it was already known in the prison system about him so I don't know when I first met him I heard the rumors and stuff about him too so it, it was kind of kind of like some weird stuff you know I get into that you know what I'm saying sooner or later but Right now, I was still talking about old towns, man. And like I say, I didn't run into him for years later. I'm trying to think of the next time that I ran into him. Um, okay, that was on, that was then on Augusta. I didn't run into towns again until, uh, this was the late 80s. I think I ran into towns again in 90, 98. I think 98 was the next time that I ran into towns. And by this time, I had already met Hercules because I, I left 
I left uh, Augusta and went to Mecklenburg. When I went to Mecklenburg, that's where I met Hercules at, at Mecklenburg. That's his brother. If I'm not mistaken, Herc is the youngest one. They called him Herc. Herc is the youngest one. So that's why I went and I met him. So by the time I ran into Terrence again, I had already met Herc. I had already got to know Herc, already know Herc's situation, Herc's story, and all this other crazy stuff that go along with it. But when I met Towns again, to my understanding, Towns had actually went on the street, right? He had got out, he was out on the street maybe uh, two or three years, to the best of my knowledge, and ended up violating or did something else, and he ended up came and coming back to prison. When I ran into him again in prison, man, he was a different dude. He was an all the way different dude. And when I tell you all the way, I mean all the way. Now, it was circumstances behind it to my knowledge, but I'm not sure, I'm just speculating. But when I ran into him, he was much smaller. He had lost a whole lot of weight, man. He was he was real skinny, real frail. He didn't have all his muscle tone or nothing like that no more. And he was doing weird things, man. He was dressing like the boys. And to my understanding, man, he was, he was, had now became a boy. The people that he actually had that's what he actually was. He had went out on the street and came back, and this is what he was acting like from the time that he had came back. And he was way older then, you know, maybe uh, probably in his, uh, he definitely had to be in his 50s, you know. And I can remember his face when he first saw me and I showed up on the block. And he seen me and he acknowledged me and he knew by my look on my face, probably the way I looked at him because the way he was dressed, he had on like some little shorts and had his little shirt tied up and stuff like that. That's the only stuff that, you know, the uh, the boys wear in there. And I looked and I was like, and I knew his face because his face hadn't changed, maybe older, but it hadn't changed. So I was like, wow. So I remember going to my cell, doing whatever I had to do, get to know my cell or whatever, whatever. And I can remember later on that day, man, he pulled up on me, right? And uh, knocked on the door, man. I look up, I see it was him. He said, uh, what's up, Bank? I said, what's up? He said, uh, let me holler at you for a minute. I said, what's going on? So he said, look, I know you may, you know, look at me a little different. I know you may be a little confused, but, you know, I went out on the street, man. I was out there for a couple of years. You know, I had a couple of problems or whatever. I came back. I ain't never getting out no more, man. I know this. I ain't never getting out no more, so, you know, I got a lot of things going on. I know you ain't gonna understand. I'm not trying to explain it to you, but I just want to let you know what you see. I'm still the same dude. It may not look like it, it may not seem like it, but I'm still the same person. And I just don't want you to lose respect for me or treat me any type of different. I said, bro, I, I, I ain't got nothing to do with what you're doing. It ain't my business. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? I know you, you ain't never did nothing to me. I ain't got no problem with you. Whatever you're doing in your personal life, that's you. I ain't got nothing to do with it. He was like, all right, man, I just wanted to say that to you, you know, because I know you. A lot of these people in here don't know me. These young dudes that don't know me, they be trying to joke on me, da 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 They trying to call me grandma, you know, and um, they don't know who they playing with, man. But I just wanted to let you know because you know me. So I just wanted to let you know what I'm doing, I got a reason for. You know what I'm saying? I said, that's what it is, bro. I ain't got nothing to do with it, you know. So he went on about his way. And like I say, in my mind now, I'm like, man, you know what I'm saying? Tales and lost his mind. But I ain't got nothing to do with it. It's not my problem. It's not my, my, my situation. So that's how you got to learn to be in prison. You got to see and don't see, hear and don't hurt, you know? And that's how I was. I ain't had nothing to do with it, you know what I'm saying? I know dudes used to joke them and everything because, you know, you got them young dudes in prison or whatnot, and they see that type of homosexuality or they see that type of stuff. And they joke on it and they, they laugh at it. Now, a lot of times they get caught up because of a situation that that person may have a man and that man ain't going to tolerate you doing or saying anything to his people, you know. But I guess they looked at Hurt like he, I mean, uh, 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 Towns like he was an older dude dressing and acting gay and they joking him and thinking he just an old gay dude in the penitentiary, not knowing his history, not knowing his past. And that could come back to haunt you because... Your mentality don't change. If you got that violence in you, it's in you. Whatever type of stuff he's doing in his personal life, that's his own, you know, demons or whatever to deal with. 
But I, I still believe, without a doubt, if somebody would try to do something to him, he definitely would have picked that Bethlehem up, and they definitely would have had to been ready for whatever, cause he would have used it. You know what I'm saying? He would. I've seen him use it. He definitely would have used it. But man, yeah. So it, it it just was a wild scene to me because, like I say, that too. At that time, um, ninety eight. Let me see. I may not have seen that neither. I may not have seen that at that time. I'm trying to remember. Maybe I did or maybe I didn't. I know I ended up seeing it again, but I don't know if that was first or last or in between. Where I seen a dude that was a dude in prison fighting and, you know, putting in work or whatever and then see them go home and come back and they, you know, they acting like that. I've seen it like two or three times, you know. I can remember a dude that I was in the wall with and I was like one of the youngest dudes in the wall. He was one of the youngest dudes in the wall. I can remember him fighting and everything and trying to, you know, let the mock be known. He young, but he fight, he ain't scared. I can remember his name was Tony. As a matter of fact, I remember a dude that hit him in the eye with a broomstick and messed his eye up. He almost lost his eye because he was beefing with a dude in there. And I can remember that, man. And um, he went home and um, came back. And I ran into him years later on Greensville. And um, that's how he was. And he, same thing. He said, man, he coming back. He don't never get out. He said that he was like that all the time. People just ain't know who knows but him. But I can remember him, and I can remember this other dude that used to sing. He used to sing, man, because when we was on Augusta, he used to play the good time stuff, and they used to have um, uh, like uh, little cookouts and stuff on the Fourth of July or whatever, with, you know, stuff like that. Sometime back in the, in the early '80s, early '90s, they still had that type of stuff going on, and it just would be for the people on the yard. We go on the yard; they might have hamburgers and hot dogs, and they have music. And they had live people trying to put on talent shows or whatever. But I remember he used to always play the good time and he used to sing and sing Prince songs or whatever. And he was real good on the good time. That's where I remember him from. But I can remember running into him years later too. He had uh, subsequently had been on the street and came back. And he had made such a big transition. When I looked at him, I didn't even know who he was. I, I, I didn't even know who he was. He had to actually explain to me who he was. And I'm still staring at him, like trying to picture him from then. And that's exactly who it was. So I had seen it, but I don't know. Towns may have been the first. So that was all new to me as well. And um, it, it, it was crazy, man. But these type of things happen in prison more often than not. I don't really like to really get into it and talk about those type of things for real because it, you know, and that's their people business and I'm sure those people got families or whatever. So that's why I don't really get into all of that. I'm only selling this situation just to explain the story, you know, and to, um, to paint the scenario. And it's a lot more that goes with it that I'm not going to get into. But at the same time, this is the type of thing that goes on in prison you know, either by, by choice or by force. You see what I'm saying? And this is what I'm letting you young people know out there, man. Prison is not where it's at. Not at all, you know. And um, like I say, that was, I seen him then. And uh, I, I remember he was still there. I think he was still there when I left. I think I left in like 2002. You know, I think I left in like 2002. So that was like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was the last time did I ever ran into him? 2002. Yeah, I think that was the last time I ever ran into him. I don't know where he ended up going. I don't know what what, what the situation was. Uh, I never really heard his name that much no more. So whether he's still in the system, whether he ended up getting out, whatever his situation may be, I never really heard anything else about it. I think the dude Dennis, uh, uh, not Dennis, William, I think William ended up getting out. I think William got out first before all of them. I think William ended up getting out of prison and um, he, uh, I think he stayed out. If I'm not mistaken, I may be wrong, I could be wrong, I don't know. Maybe he stayed out, maybe he did, but I do remember him getting out because like I say, I bag up to my Mecklenburg days, right? And in my Mecklenburg days, I can remember when I first met her, right? And if I'm not mistaken, at this time, Herc was Herc was getting visits periodically from 
Towns as well as Dennis. You know, so both of them had got out for a period of time. I think Dennis the only one that stayed out because, like I say, Towns came back. But when I met Hurt, man, man, oh Lord, when I met Hurt, Hurt reputation uh, preceded him. He was, like I say, huge, like they say he was. He was a mean, uh, <laughs> crazy, and there's no other word besides crazy, crazy cat, man, with a uh, uh, mean tag and reputation on his name. When I say tag, that tag means you got this uh, uh, reputation attached to your name. Besides the viciousness and all of that, of what he would do to an inmate, a convict, he had this other tag on his name, whereas to he was vicious when it came to them females on the street as well as in prison. And what I mean by that, Herc had already got time and had already been in segregation for years before I had met him for actually sexually assaulting female officers. Yeah, man, he had a reputation already attached to his name for sexually assaulting female officers, man. And, um, that's a vicious, vicious tag to have on your name. And um, when I first met him, I met him in segregation. And to my understanding, that's what he was back there for. He was a permanent in segregation. That means he had to stay back there until they decided he was fit for population. He could not even come out on population. I stayed on Mecklenburg for years and er never came on population. You know, never came on population. He was petitioning the people to try to get back to population, but he he, he wasn't on population, to my understanding, for double digit years, over 10 years plus, when I first ran into him, actually. So uh, it was crazy. So I got to know him in, the, in, in segregation because he was in my block and he worked in my block. When they got you in permanent segregation, they got to give you a job, Especially if you ain't got no money or nothing coming in, they got to give you, afford you opportunities to try to make money. So he was actually the house man <laughs> to their dismay because they definitely ain't want him out there walking around. And me, when you the house man back there, you, while we locked behind our cell, say, guess you locked behind the cell 24 7. So uh, when you the house man, you the one to come up, come out, and you roam around the block by yourself. When no one else is out because you got to pick up all the trays after they feed a uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You got to clean up out there, mop the floor, do whatever it is you got to do. That was a houseman's job. So he was the houseman because they had to give him a job. But so he used to go from cell to cell, talk to everybody. You know, you might need to pass something. He the one you got to go through to pass it or whatever, whatever. So I got to learn and know him like that. I told him I knew his brother, you know what I'm saying? So we got to talking and everything. And it ain't take me long talking to him to realize that yeah he was uh he was off the chain, you know off the chain a different type of dude, a uh, different type of uh, beast man that you had to deal with because like I say when you were in prison you gonna encounter all these kind of guys all these different type of characters all these different type of characteristics, uh, attitudes personalities. But you're going to have to deal with them because you can't get away from them. That's This is who you got to deal with. This is who you live with. This is your environment, you know. And like I say, he had that tag on his name. And I, what I was told, or to my understanding, that's what he was back in segregation for that uh, time right there, for that amount of time, because he supposedly had, um, and I say supposedly because I don't know, and I can't say for sure, but this is what was said. I don't want to... Uh, give no one something that they don't deserve and I don't want to take nothing away from them they shouldn't be took away from them. But to my understanding, he had assaulted an officer, a female officer on another institution before. I think it was a state farm he had tried to come on to or whatever and she, you know, refused his advances and he supposed to have beat her up, man. Like, beat her up real bad. I'm talking about, like, viciously put her in the hospital and everything and that's what he was locked up back there for and he posted, supposedly try to assault a wife after he finished beating her up. So that's why they had him back there. They had him listed as an a apex predator, you know, an apex predator, meaning that he couldn't be around females because they didn't know what he would do at any time, you know, and that's a crazy, crazy dynamics right there. Now, put that aside, as far as dealing with 
convicts and, and, and he was vicious as well. You know what I'm saying? Vicious. I told you that he knew karate. He was big as all outdoors. One of the strongest dudes, um, pound for pound that I ever met. I mean, he was just freakishly strong. He worked out all the time. He be, you know, we in our cell, so we can only look out of the tray, uh, out of the window, or out of the little chuck hole, and be sitting down to some dudes and sit down and be out there. Yeah, your chuck hole over. You be talking amongst each other. They ain't number twelve cells on Mecklenburg, so you be hollering, talking amongst each other, and he be out there talking too. And man, he used to be out there working out between his workouts. Man, just doing push ups, doing squats. He one of the few dudes that I could, that I ever met. They can do one leg squats, man. I mean, literally, he would just sit there and put one leg straight out like this, and 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 just be standing up with his arms to the side, and he got a leg straight out like this, and he could squat all the way down till his butt touched the heels of his ankle, and stand right back up on one leg. I'm talking about 10, 15 times, switch legs, do it that way, 10, 15 times, go back and forth, back and forth, do push-ups like there was nothing. Um, they had the stairway for upstairs, downstairs. Herc used to literally put his hands on the bars, reach out and put his hands on the bars and put both his legs out straight like that, like if he was in a sitting position and take and hop all the way down to the bottom of the stairs and hop all the way back without his feet ever leaving like this, ever. It was always like that, straightforward. That was core work. And man, he the dude was freakishly strong. And you look at him, and it like he had no fat on him, and he was just ripped all the way up, legs, chest, everything, neck. He just was a big, strong guy, man. And he talked with his hands. He had huge hands. I'm talking huge and rough, like, like a construction worker hands. And he always talked with his hands, and he had a little slight stutter with him. And he'd be like, I, I, I I'm, I'm, look, man, I'm telling you, it, it's just always like when he was talking to you, no matter what he was saying, it was just aggressive. It was just anger. It was just, it just came out of his pores that you knew that he was a serious dude. Man, uh, geez, they just keep on playing with me, man. And he, that's how he would be. He'd be in, like in a fit of rage at all times. But on the other side, too, the dude had a lot of complexity, complexities to him because he was intelligent as well. He used to come, sit at the door, and play dudes in Scrabble. He would sit at the door in between jobs and play dudes in chess. He might be playing this dude in chess down here, playing this dude in Scrabble right here, and he'll go from cell to cell because he was the only one that was able to move because he's the only one out there. He'll go from cell to cell, making different moves, playing words, making a move, playing words, making a move. So it got to the point at one time, me and him used to play Scrabble. He sat at the door, man, we play Scrabble. You know, because I'm stuck. I'm in the hole. I can't get out till they let me out. I'm coming from uh, Augusta with the incident that I had with Big Raymond. So I can't get out till they let me out. So this is, I'm back there for months and months. So I'm around them for, for all of this time. And I'm seeing this character. I'm seeing his demeanor. And I already know, <laughs> yeah, he, something wrong with him. You know what I'm saying? The things he say, the way he act. And man, um... Every time he seen a female, if it was a female in that booth, he was up there all day long trying to talk to her. I mean, he a bang on the booth. You hear me talking to you? You don't, don't ignore me. Don't ignore me. And he just snap when they just ain't listen to him, talk to him. They might, some of them knew. So they might say, all right, Towns, all right, how you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm working right there. I'll talk to you later. Woo, woo, woo. He was like, yeah, all right, all right. And he'll just, he'll just be like, Anxious man, and if he see a female walking on the outside of the uh, in the hallway where there was bars right there where it was hallway, and he'll see a female if he got trays or he sweeping or doing what. If he looked and see a female, he'll drop the broom, drop all that, run over to the bars and try to talk to her. Hey, hey, excuse, me, excuse me. And they were all new because it's like they all had knowledge to stay away from him, don't entertain him, don't you know what I'm saying, or uh, uh, feed into what he's doing because. He dangerous. And they would see him, man, and some of them, you could see the look on their face. They was terrified when he said to call them. They'd just wait, pushing the button, wait for the hope the door open. And the door open, they go downstairs. But before the door open, they standing like five, six feet away from him, but there's bars in between them. But he had the bars trying to talk to him, and, and they trying to get out the door. Some of them ignore him. When they ignore him, man, he turned vicious. You MF, you 
thinking this, that. he just get to cussing and balling his hands up and just, I mean, dude was, dude was, dudes was, he was different. <laughs> he was real different. And um, I just used to be looking at him like, man, this, this, this is a different type of cat here, man. You know, and sometimes dudes, you know, try to say things to him or, or try to agitate him. And man, he would go to the door and let him be known. Don't play with me. Don't, I'm telling you, I'm, do, do not play with me. Don't joke or play with me, period. And man, you better took he, you better took heed to that. I'm telling you, cause he 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 was uh he was different, man. And um when we go to wreck, and he ended up he could go to wreck with us. So if you get behind that door, what they call door gangsters, and you get behind that door and you say something to him he don't like, or you 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 antagonize him, and you go out for wreck. Is at your own risk because he gonna be out there too. And when we off a of wreck, they lock us in on a basketball cage. The it was basically just like a full court basketball that with a couple of benches out there. They was surrounded by a barbed wire fence and cage. So that's the only space you got for us to be out there. So it's like twelve of us out there at a time. And the police is gone once they lock the gate and everything. We stay out there for wreck for an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, depending on the day. And you on your own. You know what I'm saying? You on your own back there. So it wasn't a wise thing to get to talking trash to him and knowing you going outside. Because if you go outside and you don't talk trash to him, he can touch you. You know what I'm saying? And he will touch you. I can remember, too, they have other wreck dudes when they be going to wreck, it's, it's, it's like two different yards. They might line them up to go outside for wreck. And I told you the door is right in front of the block that we was in. So in order to go to wreck, you have to go down these stairways. They had to open the door. So when they would get other people ready for 